book of Jude, back to the book of Jude. And tonight we're looking at verse 12, verse 12, and follow. We're going to read down to verse 16. We won't be dealing with all of these verses tonight. I may deal with verse 12, 13, and 16, and come back next week and deal with verse 14 and 15. Go. Verse 16 kind of connects to what he's describing the apostates to be. Let's read from verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these sayings. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Father, in Jesus' name, and we have read from your precious word, the account of Luke, as he has pinned down these precious truths. And Lord, we know this is sacred scripture. And I pray now that you will open our understanding to what you are saying here. Illumine our minds through the Holy Spirit that we may see clearly what you have spoken. Now, Lord, I pray as always that you hide me behind the cross. I pray you help me to decrease as you increase in the message. Help me not any way to block the view of the cross this evening, but may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. 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 Now, when we get to this point, you now begins give a description of the apostates. And tonight we'll look at the picture of an apostate or the characteristics of an apostate. Earlier in the text, he has been using illustrations from the Old Testament to show how apostates act. Now he's using uh, descriptive words to explain to us how apostates act and give us a very graphic picture of their activity. And when we look at these verses, we can also look in 2 Peter, and we'll turn over there for a couple of verses in 2 Peter as well, that also describes them in similar terms. But when we look at these verses, he's now showing us that an apostate is going to be a person that's going to cause problems and disruptions and is not going to do anything that's going to produce good. Everything that he does is producing something that is evil or that would lead you farther away from God, not toward God. The first thing he mentions here, he says, these are spots in your feast of charity. Spots. The word spot there here in this uh, instance is not actually a word for a spot that, that would be a dirty spot, although there is a word over in the book of Second Peter that's similar 
that would mean that. But the word spot here actually means uh, hidden reefs, like rocks that are hidden and cannot be seen that will wreck a ship when it runs upon them. If uh, you know anything about Key West, and I've, I've been to Key West many times, and all around Key West there are coral reefs, and there's also a lot of old wrecked ships out there that have come up on the coral reefs and wrecked back years ago when they were not able to see the reefs because they're under the water, but they're not deep enough for the ship to get over them. And when the ship comes upon the coral reef, it runs aground on the reef and breaks the hull open and wrecks the ship. But they're always uh, going out uh, to these wrecks and and getting uh, all kinds of treasure and things out of those old ships. And that's what he's saying about apostates. He's saying that they are like a hidden reef in your church when you have them, and they are there to cause destruction and to bring about something that is going to cause wreckage or havoc. Now he mentions here in your feast of charity when they feast with you. Now the feast of charity, this is called love feast. This is what he's referring to here. The love feast. And although there was in the early church, there was what they called an agape feast or a love feast that the church observed uh, for a number of years. It was later ruled out completely in the 300s that the church took a strong stand against it because it had caused so much problem. And I don't believe it was ever something that God intended the church to be involved in because Paul condemns it even in his writings. Turn over to 1 Corinthians and let's look and see what he said. I believe it's chapter 11. And here Paul is writing. Now what the love feast was, it was a meal that they would have right before the communion service or the Lord's Supper. They would have a meal and then they would have communion. It was something that they intended to be good, and it, it should have been good because it was just to have fellowship with one another and to eat and then have the communion service. But what happened, it began to cause problems. Now here in 1 Corinthians 11, you can find Paul talking about it, and here he condemns it himself. Look in verse 20. He said, when you come together, therefore, in the one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, he's going to be talking about the Lord's Supper later on in, in these verses, but he's talking now about that meal that was before the Lord's Supper, the agape feast, the love feast. Verse 21, for in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What, he says, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Well, there Paul is certainly condemning the actions at the love feast. He's not actually condemning the feast itself, but it's what is happening there. And because of the things that are happening there, he says, you need to eat at home. you got houses, eat at the house. And uh, the, the churches in that day would have been house churches anyway. So they would have been meeting in a house. There was not... Uh, church buildings as yet that we would know today that we have. So here's what would happen. Now he talks about the poor 
and how they were being shamed. Now what would happen is everyone would bring from their home something to eat. And they were supposed to share it with everybody. It was supposed to be a time when everyone would share and everyone would be treated the same. But what was happening was that the rich would bring all kind of delicate foods and elaborate foods. And the poor would only bring what they got. But the rich would get over here and they would eat by their self and the poor would be over here having to eat only what they had that they could bring. So it had divided folks and those that had all kinds of rich foods and rich wines and things were not only gluttoning and eating, they were drinking and even becoming drunk there because it had become a time where it had done more harm than good. And Paul says, you think that I'm going to praise you in this? I'm not going to praise you in this. Now Jude is talking about this uh, here, but I, I don't think that Jude is really talking about this love feast. I think he's more or less talking about the communion service because God, uh, Paul had already condemned that. It was not something that they were uh, really doing that honored God. And when we look at Jude, he said, there are spots in your feast of charity or your love feast when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Now, if he is talking about this particular love feast, he's saying that these apostates, come in and they just come in to feed themselves. That's all they're there for. They come together, but they come in to feed themselves and they do it without fear. Now, when he puts that in, I think he's referring to communion because they had no fear or no reverence for God. They would come in and participate in the Lord's table, but yet they were not following God. They were apostates. They had rejected God's way, but yet they wanted to pretend and put on this thing of being uh, ministers of God. So they would come in without any fear. They had no fear of God about them. We certainly see how that Ananias and Sapphira would fit that picture. They had no fear of God. When they came in the church that day after selling their land and coming and telling uh, Peter and, and, and lying to the Holy Spirit in the church who runs the church and leads the church that they had sold their land for so much but they had held back part of it. They had no fear of God. They had no fear of lying to God right in the house of God and to the people of God. They come in very boldly. They were bold when they came in. They were coming in to be seen. They wanted everyone to see them and acknowledge what they had done by their gift. Now that's similar to what these folks were doing. They had no fear of God. They would come in and they would put on and they would participate in the Lord's table without any fear. And then he goes on and describes them another way here. He said they are clouds without water cared about winds. Clouds without water. When you look at 2 Peter, he calls them whales without water. And the word there is actually springs without water. Now here's what Jude is saying. These guys act like they have something that will really benefit you. And they're like a spring. And he's saying, like you may remember when there's a spring that... That uh, or there's a, a supposed to be a spring there. Maybe in our day, I guess we could kind of uh, describe it this way. Suppose there is some uh, a grand fountain somewhere that just pours out water, 
And there you, you expect to be able to get refreshing water from that place. And maybe you've been traveling and you're thirsty and you're in need of a drink. And you go to this fountain that's supposed to be putting out water. And when you get there, it's totally dry. There is no water, although there's a magnificent fountain. He's also describing them as clouds. A cloud, when it's so dry. And the ground is so dry and the crops are dying and everything is dying and there is no water. And there comes a cloud by. A cloud that looks like it would be full of rain and ready to just pour the rain out. And you sit there and wait in anticipation of this cloud just giving out rain. And then the winds take that cloud and just blow it on the way. And there's no rain. That's what he says these men are. They act like they're going to give you something that will be satisfying and refreshing. But what happens? They don't have anything to offer you. It's all just a show. When they pass over, it's all gone. And you have nothing. They have nothing that you get from them. That's what we see Every day we see those kind of folks everywhere in churches. Everywhere we see them. Now let's give them another description here and we'll comment on that. He said, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots. Trees whose fruit wither. Now this word trees here means late autumn trees. That's what the word entails. And what he's saying is, he says, here's a tree that looked like it should have produced all kind of fruit. But it's just like a late autumn tree when now the spring and summer has passed and the leaves now have already fallen off of this tree and there's not one bit of fruit on the tree. It has no fruit. And what happens when we look at apostates, here's what you see. You see them as though they're going to give you something that's going to be so satisfying that's going to meet your need. That's going to really, really help you in your thirsty situation or in your hunger, hungry situation. But when you get through listening to them, you have received absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I have heard men many times that have talked and talked and talked. And when they got through talking and you left, you have not heard one thing. Amen. Not one thing. I mean, absolutely nothing have you heard. And that's what he's saying. This is what they are. They can talk big. They can uh, give you all kinds of fine speech. And he talks about that in verse 16. But they have nothing to say. It leaves you empty just like a cloud that would blow over without leaving any water. Their message and all they have to offer leaves you absolutely empty. Nothing there of substance. A tree that should be full of fruit. That you can go pick the fruit and receive something that will, in, uh, uh, that will help you to grow and nourish you. But there is no fruit on them. They are dead. And here he says, not only are they dead, they are twice dead. Plucked up with the roots. Now he's comparing that to the late autumn tree that would have lost its leaves 
and would have been dead or dormant for the winter. But here he goes a step farther. He said that these men are not just, not just dormant for the winter. They just not lost their leaves for the winter. But they are totally dead. They have no live roots. There's nothing about them that's alive. They are all dead and they are ready to be plucked up by the roots and discarded. And one place Jesus said, throw them into the fire. Because they have nothing. They have no life. They're dead. Apostates, although we see them everywhere. They're in large churches. They're in small churches. It has nothing to do with the size of the church. You've got apostates, as many apostates in small churches. You've got big churches. They're everywhere. But their message leaves you without anything. You get nothing from them when they talk. And they can talk. And, and they can uh, pretend to have something that will really satisfy you. But the more you listen to them, the less satisfied and the less uh, it, it uh, quenches your thirst because there is nothing there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when a Christian gets under these kind of men they wind up dying themselves because it will destroy you. And that's what he said. They are like hidden reefs. They're out to destroy you. You're not going to get anything from them. Their message is going to leave you dead. Now, we can look out and see many today that give a message that is nothing more than just hot air flowing out from them. Because their message is totally unbiblical and unscriptural. Now, look at verse 13 because he's going to use some more descriptive words. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Now he's talking about the seas when they get high and the waves get high. Now if you've ever lived around the sea, you see this all the time, especially when the winds are high and during hurricanes and things. The seas and the waves get high. And they foam. They actually come in so, so fast and so high and and, and and the waves come in so that it just creates a foam around the seashore. And in that foam, there's all kinds of things washed up from the sea and thrown up on the seashore. All kinds of seaweed and all kinds of old things that's out in, in the sea. And sometimes they bring in that stuff and throw it up on the, on the shore and just blanket the seashore with it. And it has an awful odor. It stinks. It's horrible. You can smell it for a long way. And when that happens, you know, it kind of hurts tourists, uh, the economy, because the tourists don't want to be on the beach with all that stench. And sometimes they try to clean it up, but it's just about impossible. So what they usually do is just let it deteriorate and dissolve itself. But what he's saying here is that this is the way apostates are. They roar and they blow and they foam. But what actually comes out of them is all of the filth that is inside them, not anything that's godly. It's just their own ungodly Filth, and he's going to call them ungodly there in the next few verses because that's what they are. Now when he talks about ungodly, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're living immoral. It means that what they're doing, if they're not doing it for God, 
God. It's for themselves. And God is not even in the picture. They're just doing what they do for their own, for their own selfish motives. Raging waves of the sea, foaming hour up their own shame. That's what comes up out of them. And you listen to them long enough, and that's all you hear is their own shame, their own selfish, selfish ambitions and that coming out. Listen to them and see if it's not all about them. It'll always be about them. They'll be boasting about their, what they done, what we, what has come up of me, what I, what God, and, and try to connect God with. But it's all about drawing attention to themselves because that's all they have. They don't have God inside them, so all they can preach is themselves. And they throw it out at you. There it comes. Now, what else did he say? He calls them wandering stars here. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. When we call them a wandering star, he's calling them a star that or a meteorite or something that has left the orbit that is supposed to operate in. Now you look at the planets and all of the stars of heaven, they all operate within an orbit that God has set them to operate in. And if one gets out of that orbit, then it burns itself out. And, and you see them many times when you see meteorites, meteorites uh, uh, you see them, we call them shooting stars. That's what he's saying these are. They're, they're not operating within God's parameter. He's saying that they just go out in their own direction, doing their own thing, just going out there. And they may shine for just a little while, but then they're going out. And where they go is they uh, to the blackness and the darkness forever that's been reserved for them. That's where they go. And of course... When he refers to that, he's referring to hell because hell is dark and black without any light. So he's saying wandering stars. They're not, they're not, they're not operating in God's will or for his, in his path. They're operating in the path that they went out after. And they're just shooting they may look bright for just a minute. How most shooting stars will get your attention for a minute. And that's the way they do. They may get your attention for a little while. But they're going to be gone into the blackness and darkness forever that God has reserved for them. And if you follow them, that's where they will lead you because they're not in an orbit or a, a path. That God has put them in. So when Jude begins to describe these individuals, he certainly uses some very picturesque language to describe them. Now, let's look at verse 16 because this continues to describe them. These are murmurers. And we talk about murmurers. He, He's talking about this, this word, I think, is associated with the cooing of a dove. And, and it means that they just go around murmuring very softly and lightly. And they murmur. And when you murmur, the word murmur is always used to murmur against God and, and the ways of God and the things that God has brought about in your life. They murmur against God's way. But then he said they're complainers. Complainers means that they 
go a step farther and they openly begin to complain about their lot in life or where God has them. So they begin to complain about the situation that they're in or the circumstances of life that God has placed them in. They can't accept that as being God. They have to complain. They murmur against God and His way. They complain about where they are and where God has them. Complainers. Look at this. Walking after their own lust. They have not the Holy Spirit. So they're not guided by the Holy Spirit. They are led by their own desires. Their own lust. Whatever they lust for. That's what drives them. And that's why it's so hard for me to even listen to one of those guys for five minutes if I have to turn turn one of them on you know there it, 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 it's just hard because you automatically see nothing but them God is nowhere about them folks they're only only teaching and preaching what they lust after what guides them they walk after their own lust. And look at this. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words. They use impressive language. They want to impress you. And they want to impress those that would benefit them the most. That's what he's referring to. Because he says, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They have respect of person because they're looking to somehow use you. And Peter talked about that. They're looking somehow to get you to look at them as being so great and having such an important word or you have such an important law that they will pull you in because they want to treat you as though they admire you, but only to get take advantage of you. That's what they do. And that means if they're in a service, they're going to cater to those that will benefit them the most. They're going to go where it will benefit them the most. They're going to have their uh, people seated in places that would be those that would benefit them the most would have the special seating at their meetings or something. That's who they cater to. That's what he said. And they use these impressive words. Great swelling words. Words that they know will impress folks. And they also use flattering words because we saw that in other scriptures. Flattery, which is always a lie. Flattery is always bad. It's always a lie. Compliments all right, but flattery is always bad. But that's what they do, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. They flatter people to gain advantage. And when you have people that live just like they do and are driven by their own lust, they cater to that. Because when one of these guys that is considered a superstar preacher and most of them are celebrities, celebrity type and people want to be associated with celebrity and when they get around them and this celebrity flatters them that same thing that's in him is in him and they come, he draws them in and he takes advantage of them that's where they get all these needs. And when you hear men talk about the 
for materialism, you mark it down that that man is not of God. I don't care who he is or what he's talking. He talks about, and that's all he is interested in, is his materialism. I remember hearing uh, Dr. Leroy Thompson one time now, if you've never saw him, you need to see him. Y'all all during his message, he'd be bringing money, laying it on his podium and laying it around uh, on the stage. And by the time he gets through, there'll be stacks of money laying everywhere. And he he says, he uses this phrase, money cometh to me. And he uses that. He boasts in that. And he, he has written a book about money cometh. And it does. It does. Because he appeals to all those people and he's taking advantage of and using these words. And I heard him say, people know me and my family by the cars we drive. And he talked about his road Royce. His wife Bentley. And his teenage children's Mercedes. That's what they drive when we go through town. People know what buy their automobiles. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine somebody boasting that's supposed to be a man of God and saying that somebody knows me and my family based on the luxury automobiles we drive instead of our walk with God. Yes, yes. John Calvin, one of the great, greatest men that ever lived, he said the number one thing in the life of a preacher is humility. Yes. The number one thing. Yes. And John Calvin had it so when he died, he didn't even want his grave marked. Mm. Said, just put a mound of dirt there, like them other old men of God. And he was so concerned about doing anything that would impress someone or draw attention to him, said that he was probably one of the most humble men that we've ever had, mm. the old uh, men of God. Look at today what we have. The very opposite. Arrogance. Pride. Which is absolutely and totally a stench in the nostrils of God. Yes. Pride and arrogance. And that's what we have. No humility. The number one virtue of a believer and especially a preacher is humility, and that is the number one thing that we're lacking all through the church today in every pulpit, is humility. We don't have it anymore. And he said they speak great swelling words to impress you so they can take advantage of you. And Dr. Leroy leaves those services with his bags full oh, of money. their money, money. <laughs> and go buy more oh. roll Royces. I forget how much he paid for a dog. He said $30,000 on a dog. And they said, why? He said, come out only that kind of dog. And, uh, but that's why, and, and these men want you to believe no. that they are godly. They want you to believe that they're speaking for God. No. And they are apostate to the core. Amen. They are apostates. Oh, and Jude calls them out. Let's stand. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have given us your word. And we can look in your word and know the mind of God. And Lord, the one thing that we know 
indicates a person is not walking with God, and that is pride. Because that's the one thing that Satan had that caused him to fall. And Lord, help us, help us, Lord, to see that the virtue of a Christian is humility. And that we would recognize that. And we would be aware of our own selfish desires and our own pride that may want to raise up in us. And I pray, Father, that you will help us keep us in a position where we can shine. And that folks will not see us but see you. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.